Hello, everyone, everywhere. This is Pastor Robert Thibodeau. Welcome to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God. We're so glad you're joining us here today. We're blessed each and every time we get to gather together around the Word of God. It is such a blessing to be able to come to you through Evangelism Radio and on Facebook Live. If you're watching us on Facebook Live right now, give us some love, the likes, the shares, the thumbs up, all that good stuff that, that helps us be seen out there. And be sure you share us and tell your friends and family that you are listening to Freedom Through Faith live on Facebook right now. Praise God. We're going to be talking about a controversial subject today, as if I never talk about things like that, about will the church be raptured or do we have to go through the tribulation? Now, uh, there's some big controversy on that, but before we get into that, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started in the Bible study. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne this day, your throne of grace and of mercy, that we may receive mercy and find grace that helps in our time of need. We come to you this day asking you, Father, to send your Holy Spirit to lead and guide this discussion about such an important topic. We pray for revelation understanding, Lord, and we just give to you all honor and glory and praise for all that is accomplished. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Join me as we lay the foundation for this Bible study. I call it our foundation of faith. It's commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. And repeat these words after me out loud, at least loud enough for your own two ears to hear. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It is so important for your own ears and your mind to comprehend it's your voice saying these words. So what you are saying goes through your ears, in through your mind, down into your heart, and then comes back up out of the mouth in abundance. Praise God. So just repeat these words after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended up into heaven and sits now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come soon to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, I have some friends, uh, some pastor friends as well, who hold that the rapture is not biblical. That the rapture has is some made-up fairy tale to tickle the fancy of some misguided Christians and make them feel good and instead of preparing them for the coming trials and the tribulations that are sure to happen. Some argue that the pre-tribulation rapture view is just too new to be considered viable. Critics will point to the origin of the modern pre-tribulation view and credit John Darby uh, way back in the 1800s with its founding. But is that assessment actually historically accurate? Now, in my opinion and the opinion of some other scholars in, in this area who are far, far more advanced in their research than I am, uh, I don't believe that assessment is accurate. And in this series of discussions today and probably in a week, we will have, let's just say over the next couple of weeks, I will lay out my argument about the rapture and the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I'm going to talk about some other things as well, but I want to set this, I want to state this position right up front. And I want to be very clear about this so you understand me. You can believe the church will be taken out pre-trib. You could be taken, it'll be taken out in mid-trib. You can believe even post-trib. You can even believe that you're going to remain here until the second coming of Christ. That does not matter to me, to Bob Thibodeau. 
Okay, It does not affect your salvation if you have made the decision to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, if you have made the decision to ask him to come into your heart and to be Lord of your life, the position on the rapture does not matter to me personally. Okay, The doctrinal plan of salvation has no bearing on yours, mine, or others' decision on the pre-tribulation rapture, the mid-tribulation rapture, the post-tribulation rapture, or no rapture at all. But yet... There are some pastors and some denominations who want to make that a dividing point. Well, if you believe in the rapture, you're not saved. Wrong answer. All right. I do not hold to that misinterpretation of Scripture. But yet, I want to state my case. I want to try, I want to try and present to you my best defense for my position. I'm believing there is coming very soon a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, if you want to stick around and go through the tribulation, more power to you. All right. If there is an opportunity to get on the first boat and escape the mess that's coming, I want to be on it. All right. And if that first boat never materializes and it happens to be in the middle of the tribulation, I still want on that one. All right. If it comes in at the end, and, and then, you know, the end comes. Okay, I'm still going to hold fast that no matter what is taking place in my life, in this country, and in this world, it does not matter. Jesus is still Lord. Amen? That's all that matters. Jesus is my Savior, your Savior, every believer's Savior. So the position on the rapture does not matter according to your salvation. You must accept his forgiveness. You must accept his plan for your salvation. Everything else is second. And if, when a church or a pastor or some other believer tries to say your view on the rapture is what determines whether or not you're going to heaven or hell, they are misinterpreting scripture, not you. All right, I, I just want to state that right up front. I want to be very clear on that. Okay, now, this rapture event is going to cause such chaos in the world that it will usher in the opportunity for some political figure known as the Antichrist to rise to power because he is offering those who have been left behind some type of hope. Think about the chaos this is going to cause. Let's just say right now there's over 7 billion people on the planet. And we've talked about this before. Uh, according to statistics, approximately 20% are born-again believers. I say, you know, 50% are quote-unquote believers. But, you know, you can see from the church parking lots on a Sunday morning, you have to question those statistics, all right? You can have, you know, let's just use the United States as an example. If you ask someone, are you a Christian? 80% of the people say, raise their hand and say, yes, I am. Then you ask another qualifying question. Do you go to church? That drops down to about 70%. And then you ask those people, do you go to church more than once a month? that drops it down to about 35%. And then you ask uh, the 70%, do you go more than once or twice a year? And it drops down to maybe 25%. So out of the 80% of the population who says they're Christian, only, what, let's, let's say 80% of 300 million is 2.4 million or 240 million. And out of the 240 million, only a quarter of those go to church more than once a month. That means, yet what, uh, 61, 180 million people go less than once a month. And out of the 180 million, approximately 100 million of those go once or twice a year at most. All right. So you have to question that. 
And out of all those that do not go to church on a regular basis, if you dig deeper into their lifestyle, you have to question, you know, I mean, they are definitely not living for Christ. They are living for the world. And you have to question that. We don't have to question it. We don't have to say, well, you're, you're drinking a beer. You're going to hell. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, there has, Jesus said, judge them by, your, by their fruit. Okay? I am not saying you have to go to church to be saved. Don't, don't say Pastor Bob said that. I am not saying that if you do not go to church, you are going to hell. I am not saying that. I am saying there should be fruitful evidence about your true identity as a Christian. If there's no evidence, there's no fruit. Jesus said, judge the tree by its fruit. That doesn't mean you have to be in full-time ministry. It doesn't mean that you have to, you know, go soul winning every Saturday morning, attend church six times a day on Sunday, uh, and, you know, do all this other stuff. It's not saying that. I'm just saying that your lifestyle should reflect your Christianity. All right? So, Let's, let's go ahead and get started in this study. Now, I've been a follower of several, as I said, people who are better scholars at this than I am. Uh, Dr. David Reagan with the Lamb and Lion Ministries, the host of the Christ and Prophecy television program. I've been following him for years. Uh, he and his associate, Nathan Jones, have presented ample evidence through their programming about the soon return of Jesus and the calling, you know, the, the rapture. Matter of fact, I interviewed Nathan Jones on my podcast, the Kingdom Crossroads podcast, before. So what I'm going to present to you today is simply a synopsis of information I've gleaned from their ministry and others over the years. I mean, there is so much information out there. Perry Stone, he's another one that I study from, among many others. So I don't want you to think that Brother Bob's just pulling this stuff out of thin air. I don't want you to think that I'm misinterpreting scripture just from my own Bible study time. That's not right. The information I'm going to give to you today and next week is gleaned from numerous resources. Okay. Now, all of these resources point to one thing. The rapture is set up and about to happen. Well, they've been saying that since Jesus was here the first time. And we're one day closer every day that goes by. Amen. The early church fathers, such as Barnabas, who was alive in the first church era, you know, the first hundred years or so after the uh, death of Jesus, uh, Papias, Justin Martyr, right? Uh, he was born right after the first century. Uh, there's others uh, that... You know, I could go on half a dozen of them through the notes, but they all wrote about the soon return of Jesus Christ, the central argument of the pre-tribulation rapture is what they discussed. And so this went all the way back to the times of Jesus, that the rapture was going to take with John. I mean, the, the book of Revelation, right, was written by the apostle John. He was with Jesus, right? The one Jesus loved. You cannot say John didn't know what he was talking about. Okay? And then all these others that I just mentioned who were alive before John died or very shortly thereafter. So they were still talking to eyewitnesses or the next generation right after them. So this goes all the way back that far historically, okay? Biblical truth is determined by Scripture, not how the teaching has been perceived at different times in human history. When Augustine began spiritualizing the Bible, his view of a non-literal interpretation took hold of the church all the way up until the Renaissance, just obliterating the premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture views in favor of amillennialism. I don't believe in any rapture at all. I don't even believe in the millennial. Right? But some medieval writers uh, talked about, they issued statements and discussions that distinguished the rapture 
as a separate event from the second coming. When allegorical interpretation began to fall off, beginning with the Reformation in 1400, right, the 14 or 1500s, that's when the quote-unquote Reformation came, right? 1,200, 1,300 years after the original writers from the time and the era of the first church in the book of Acts, you'd think the first church would have a better understanding, right? But when the Reformation came about, which I'm not, you know, praise God for the Reformation, all right? It cleared up some things, especially that when Martin Luther nailed those thesis is to the the wall of or the door of the the church it opened the bible up from just simply the priest being the only one that can tell you what it means to allowing each individual to read the bible for themselves study what it means i mean that started you know the geneva bible and and that's how the pilgrims got over here because of all the persecution it was just the Reformation was a good thing, okay? However, to misinterpret Scripture and say there is no rapture, I believe is wrong. That's that's my position. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, they all wrote, people from that era all wrote concerning the rapture that it was a, sec, a separate occurrence from the second coming. Even in the more modern churches, like Witherby, William Witherby in 1800s, they were precursors to the John Darby support of the view. But yet Darby, you know, because he, I guess he's one of the latest ones to come out with it, a lot of reformists say, well, that rapture stuff, that pre tribulation that's, that's just from, that was invented by Darby. It was not invented by Darby. I just laid out that it went all the way back to the first church in the book of Acts and built up from there, all right? So the pre-tribulation rapture view is indeed not only biblical, but supported throughout church history, amen? And my belief that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church stands on the following foundations that we'll briefly discuss today. First, we have to agree the Bible is the Word of God. We're going to lay out these foundations. This has to be the beginning. Can we agree? The Bible is the Word of God. 66 books called the Bible. Inerrant, God's Word, infallible. God's message to mankind, explaining His purposes and plans for all the ages. No other document can be reliably trusted, not even remotely reach the bar for the requirements of authentication that the Bible has reached and attained so easily. I mean, 66 books written by 40-some different authors over thousands of years, and they all agree, right? I mean, and it, God just reveals step by step by step to the day we are in today. Praise God. So that's number one. Number two, the Bible is to be interpreted literally. Can we agree on that? God means what he says. God says what he means. God wants his creation to know his will, period. While God does indulge in, you know, some picturesque descriptions and parables and expl explanation almost always follows the description or the parable, and context is provided for the explanation. Spiritualization of text, therefore, has no real proper place in interpreting Scripture. And, you know, any what they call eschatological viewpoint must then be thrown out if it's based on the reader's desire to spiritualize the Bible into whatever meaning they want to put into it. Take the Bible for its plain sense. Dr. Reagan says, you know, if you look for the plain sense and, you know, only that plain sense, then you'll never end up with nonsense, right? So number three, the church and Israel are not the same thing. They are separate entities. Now, there's, I'll take a cup of coffee, a sip of coffee while you think about what I just said. The church and Israel 
are not the same thing. Israel's not the church. The church is not Israel. A believer in Jesus Christ becomes a member of the church, a part of the body of Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. But a member of the church does not become a form of spiritual Israel. God's promises to Israel as a people and a nation are not the same as his promises for the bride of Christ, the church. Think about that. Also, the Bible talks about there is a literal 1,000-year millennium. The Bible talks about a future, literal, 1,000-year period of time. The Greek word is chilas for 1,000 years. It appears six times just in Revelation 20, clearly describing the, the time period is 1,000 literal years. The purpose for this time period is for Jesus Christ to have an earthly kingdom from which to base his rule and to fulfill his promises. Praise God. And there's a whole slew of scriptures beginning back in Genesis all the way up into the New Testament, into Romans and, and all that, that describe this period of time. Next is, there is going to be a literal seven-year period of time where all hell breaks loose on earth called the seven-year tribulation. It is an upcoming time period that has been set aside for God, the Father, to pour out his wrath upon the evil in the world, to regather Israel from the four corners of the earth back into its land, to force Israel to acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah. That's the purpose of the tribulation, is that it will force Israel to recognize Jesus as the Messiah and for him to return and fight for his believing remnant. And there is a slew of scripture references that talk about that. This time period begins with a covenant between Israel and the Antichrist. They will actually make an agreement with the Antichrist. Why would they do that? Go back to what I said at the beginning. When the church is yanked out in the rapture, all chaos is breaking out forth on the earth. People are going to start talking about, man, the, what these Christians said, it's true. It really is like that. Well, that plays into the hand of the Antichrist because he knows, the Bible says, he knows his time is short. So what's he supposed to do? Well, since the Christians are gone, and the Jews are starting to, hey, wow, this thing might happen. So tell you what I'm going to do, Israel. If it'll bring peace to this area of the world, I will make a seven-year pact with you, and you can start having temple worship and sacrifices, all that good stuff. And they're going to go with it because that means people will be coming to them to seek God, right? Because after all, all the Christians are gone. Who's left? Israel. Well, let's, you know, so he's going to make peace. The whole world will make peace with Israel. Doesn't last very long, but they're going to try. All right. So the length of the tribulation is seven years. And it's described in a variety of ways. You know, one seven year block consisting of, you know, two times time and half a time, and, you know, two years plus one year plus half a year, or two periods of 1260 days each, or two 42 month periods. This is throughout the Bible Daniel, Revelation, you know, it's all talked about there. Followed by the next thing we need to agree on, Jesus will return to the earth again. The Bible says Jesus will physically return again to the earth. Jesus' return is to defeat his enemies, set up his throne, restore Israel, but then it says he rules with a rod of iron. And he shares his authority with those who overcame evil while in the body of Christ. We will, the Christian believers, will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in his 1,000-year millennial reign.
That's very clear. Next, the Bible teaches us about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, speaks in an event called the rapture, which is in Latin, rapio, in Greek, harpazo, which means to catch up, to snatch away, or to take out. That's what the word means. It says in verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. Praise God. Paul states that the concept of the rapture, of the rapture is meant to encourage believers during this age. Other New Testament references on the rapture, you know, John chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. These statements form the foundation about the Bible and its interpretation to provide the foundation on which we are analyzing right now the reasons why I believe the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, the following describes the rapture itself and the second coming as different events, right? And um, to save time, uh, we're already almost a half hour into this. I'm not going to go over all these scriptures. I'm just going to give you some quick references. The Bible says we must see the rapture. Uh, John 14, uh, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We'll see the rapture. It says, and the Bible sees and predicts the second coming. Zechariah 14, 1 to 21. Matthew 24, great scripture reference given by Jesus himself. Verses 29 to 31. Mark 13, 24 to 27. Luke uh, 21, verse 25, 27. Revelation 19 talks about as separate events. They are not the same event. They are separate events events because when the verses are compared they describe two very different things now what i want to do i'm just going to give you a list here and we're going to talk about what it means okay the rapture itself believers meet christ in the air the second coming christ returns to the mount of olives to meet the believers that are on the earth how can you have two separate things, right? Rapture. Mount of Olives is unchanged in the rapture. In the second coming, Mount of Olives is divided, forming a valley east of Jerusalem. Two separate things. For the rapture, living believers obtain glorified bodies, right? Second coming, living believers remain in their same bodies. The rapture. Believers are going to heaven, the wedding supper of the Lamb, right? The beam of judgment seat. Second coming, glorified believers come from heaven, while earthly believers stay on earth. The rapture, the world's left unjudged, living in sin. The second coming, the world is judged and righteousness is established. The proof of the rapture depicts the deliverance of the church from the wrath to come. The second coming depicts deliverance of believers who endured through the wrath. Another one for the rapture, no signs precede it. It's sudden and unexpected. Second coming, many signs are preceding it. The rapture's revealed only in the New Testament, but the second coming is revealed in both the Old and the New Testaments. The rapture deals only with the saved believers. The second coming deals with both saved and unsaved. And the rapture, Satan still remains free in order to influence the seven years of tribulation that are coming. The second coming, Satan's bound and thrown into the abyss. Since the rapture and the second coming clearly are describing different events that do not occur anywhere in the Bible at the same time, that rules out the post-tribulation rapture scenario, in my opinion. The rapture is described as occurring at any time without warning. 
Jesus states in Matthew 24, verse 42 and 44, to therefore keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Not only do believers in Christ not know when to expect him, but the Father himself even left Jesus unaware of the exact time he'd be sent for his return. Jesus stated in Matthew 24, verse 36, no one knows about that day or that hour, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Right? And there's other verses that describe the same thing. They indicate that Jesus' arrival will come when nobody expects it. The second coming, on the other hand, is preceded by many events, such as the rise of the Antichrist in Revelations 12, verse 13 to 17. Zechariah 13, 7 through 9. Uh, there's a treaty with Israel in Daniel 27, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Matthew 24, 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4 describe the rebuilding of the temple. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 describe the rebuilding of the temple, as well as plagues and judgments and persecutions destroying most of the world's population. The book of Revelation reports these events as occurring when? During a period of seven years of tribulation, which Revelation says precedes the second coming. Because the rapture could happen at any moment with no warning, no signs, the second coming is preceded by so many signs, then the rapture and the second coming must be two separate events. The rapture has to occur before the seven years' worth of signs because Christians are called to look for the Lord's return rather than looking for signs such as the Antichrist's arrival. Once the signs begin, the seven-year countdown begins towards its climax with Christ's return at the second coming. That's two separate events, folks. Jesus' return dismisses any of the other viewpoints related to a rapture that occur within or at the end of tribulation. Next, the rapture itself and the removal of the restrainer, as Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, at the same time. In 2 Thessalonians, the church at Thessalonica was afraid due to a false report that they had already entered the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, and they had somehow missed the rapture. They were upset. Oh, man, we missed it. How did we miss this? The Apostle Paul assured them that the Antichrist would not be revealed until a restraining force would be taken away so that the man of lawlessness, lawlessness could then be revealed. Because the revealing of the Antichrist coincides with the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period, beginning with the peace treaty with Israel, then the restrainer has to be removed before that can happen, before the tribulation. As the Holy Spirit also works in salvation during the tribulation period, then it must be the church that's the restrainer, and that church has to be removed. Therefore, the rapture and the removal of the church must be the same thing. They must coincide at the beginning of the seven years. Praise God. I hope you're seeing this. The tribulation is for Israel's redemption, not the church's redemption. It's for Israel's redemption. I'm going to take another sip of coffee. Jeremiah. Ver, chapter 30, verse 7, describes the tribulation as the times of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 7 says, how awful that day will be. No one will like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he, Jacob, will be saved out of it. The book of Matthew, whose primary audience is the Jews, Jesus explains to his Jewish followers what life will be like during the tribulation. Also, in Revelation chapter 12, it describes in picturesque terms a woman who gives birth and has to flee 
due to persecution during the time of tribulation. The context shows the woman is Israel. And again, the battle of Armageddon is the whole world coming to destroy Israel. Two-thirds of the Jewish people will be killed during these battles. Two-thirds of them. These texts and others show that the tribulation is meant for the redemption and saving of the Jewish people. So why are the Jews the object of persecution during the tribulation? Good question. For one, Satan hates the Jewish people for giving the world the scriptures and giving the world the Messiah, and he wants to just thwarts God's promises to the Jews, right? Remember back when we started at the beginning that the purpose for the tribulation was to save the Jewish people? Secondly, the Jews have to be brought so low that they will finally call out to Jesus as their Messiah, calling him, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The tribulation then is used for Israel's redemption, which also results in the punishment of the wicked. The church doesn't fit into that scenario. They're left out of the purposes of the tribulation. They would need to be removed or caught up before the tribulation begins, if that's the case. Next, the tribulation is definitely not for the church. The tribulation is God's wrath upon the unbelieving world, not for those who are saved from Christ's resurrection through the rapture called the church. Yes, 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 yes. Believers have suffered throughout all human history, but there's a special time, just like the flood, just like the flood. Jesus even said it's going to be like the days of Noah. There's a special time just like the flood called the day of the Lord's wrath. Christians suffering and the tribulation day of the Lord are different things, two separate things. And the believers in Christ during the church age represented by the church in Philadelphia and, and the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Matter of fact, Revelation 3.10 says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I also will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Well, how can you be tested if you're not on the earth? I mean, how can you be kept from that hour of testing if you're not on the earth, right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, To wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. In verse 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, he also says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. Through Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall be saved from God's wrath through him? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Not the obedient, the disobedient. Colossians 3, verse 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Praise God. Again and again and again and again, Scripture states the church is not meant to endure God's wrath. Praise God for that. Amen? Now, God's wrath involves the entire seven years of tribulation. It begins on day one. The view that the rapture will occur at the midpoint of the tribulation is based upon 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, which states the rapture will occur at the blowing of the last trumpet. This mid-tribulation rapture view then declares this trumpet to be the last of the seven trumpets in Revelation 11 that is blown at the midpoint of the tribulation. Why, of the 114 different references to trumpets in the Bible, these two are identified as one and the same. I don't know where they get that from. Okay, They're 
definitely taking it out of context. The context clearly shows the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 is blown for believers. Whereas the seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 11 are sounded for the unbelievers. The Revelation trumpets, therefore, can have no relevance to the church believers. Proponents of the pre-wrath rapture, we believe the rapture will occur. How can I say this? Make it make sense. There are some that believe that you're either pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and that the trumpets that are blown indicate the mid-trib rapture. There are some who believe that about three-quarters of the way through the tribulation, five years or so into the tribulation period, there will be four comings of Jesus Christ. Just listen to me for a second. David, Dr. David Reagan wrote in a very good article called The Pre-Wrath Rapture. said, those who espouse this viewpoint that the seal judgments are the wrath of man and Satan and that they continue through the first half of the tribulation and into the second half, right up to the three-quarter point or shortly thereafter, they place the trumpet judgments in the last 25%, the last quarter of the tribulation, and the bowl judgments in the first 30 days following the end of Daniel's 70th week of year. But isn't it Jesus himself, if I'm reading this correctly, isn't it Jesus himself who breaks the seals that launch each of the Revelation 6 seal judgments that occur at the beginning of tribulation? Isn't that right? Also, the seven angels who blow the trumpets that initiate each of the trumpet judgments are given their trumpets where? At the throne of God. Revelations 8, 2. And Revelations 15, verse 1, states that the bold judgments at the end of the tribulation finish the wrath of God. Not begin it. They finish it. Because these judgments are initiated by who? Jesus himself. At the beginning of the tribulation period, the whole tribulation then must be part of God's wrath on the earth, which, as we've already concluded, the church is exempt from. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, man. We are getting ready to wrap this up here. Folks, the point I'm trying to make is to give you encouragement. You know, whether you want to hold to the post-tribulation wrath, the amillennial wrath, the mid or mid-trib resurrection or rapture, whatever it is, I'm just trying to, in some type of coherent fashion, to lay out my points of view concerning the pre-trib rapture. And I'm going to conclude this by making this last point. The Old Testament and the book of Revelation leave the church out of the tribulation period. Think about that. The focus of the tribulation period to pour out God's wrath on the earth just like the flood. That's what Jesus said. It'll be just like the days of Noah, right? They leave the church out of the wrath. Isaiah 24, 22, Zephaniah 3, 8, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 12. The, bring, the tribulation brings the Jewish people to the point where they will finally accept Jesus as their Messiah. Matthew 23, 39, Luke 13, 35. They all talk about that. It's addressed by the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. And it's written to the unbelievers and to the Jewish people. And in a biblical content concerning the tribulation day of the Lord, the church 
is not found. I can't put it any plainer than that. When you read the Bible in context, the church is not described as going through the tribulation. That's good news. <laughs> to me it is. I said, if, now, does that affect your salvation if you don't hold to that view? Not at all. Not at all. If you want to go through the entire tribulation period, more power to you. If I'm completely off on this and I have to go through the tribulation period, praise God. But if I have an opportunity to get out on the first boatload, I want out. I don't know about you, but I want out. And from everything I just described and everything I've been studying, over all these, gosh, 27 years, the pre-trib rapture is the only one that makes complete sense. Amen? Now, the whole concept of the church was a mystery to the Old Testament prophets. Think about it. They focused only on the nation of Israel. The book of Matthew is written to the Jewish people, whom Jesus, addressing in Matthew 24, uh, as well as Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, they all cover the church age. But then there is no more mention at all of the church until the tribulation and the day of the Lord in chapter 6 and 18 in the book of Revelation. Chapter 19, the church returns. Oh, wait a minute. The church is discussed in chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. And then there's no mention of it until chapters after the tribulation contained in, in chapters 6 and 8. Let me rephrase that. Chapters 6 to 18. No mention of the church. No mention of the church at all. It's talked about up to chapter 3. Then there's nothing from chapter 6 until chapter 18. But in chapter 19, the church is said, it said what? The church returns with Jesus. Praise the Lord. Not suffering. We're not returning so we can now have our turn at the tribulation period. We're not returning so that we can be tested and tried. No. It says we're celebrating with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. The Mary Supper of the Lamb. We're preparing to return with Jesus to this earth. Hallelujah. Time seems to go so fast where I'm getting into these in-depth studies like this. I know I never have time to complete these thoughts. That's the reason I said we're going to be talking about this again next week. Okay? Because I, I'm still, I'm about halfway through my notes. I knew this was going to happen. Praise the Lord. But I hope this explanation explains why I, Pastor Bob, believes the church is about to go through a tremendous change. True believers will simply vanish in the blink of an eye, Scripture says, just before all hell breaks loose on the earth. Amen. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Now, there will be some churchgoers who will be left behind. Wait a minute, Brother Bob. How can churchgoers and believers be left behind? Oh, they'll be shocked, for sure. But it's because they were just going through the motions of being a Christian. They had deceived themselves about the status of their salvation. There's no middle ground, folks. There is no middle ground in being a Christian. You cannot live with one foot in the world system and one foot in heaven. You cannot straddle the fence and try to be a friend of both systems, the world system and heaven system. There's one choice, one decision. It could only be one chance to make that decision. Bible's clear. There are some who have never heard the gospel, but they'll still be born again. How can that be? The Bible says God reveals himself in nature. 
Does that mean you have to worship Mother Earth and all that? Well, if you've never heard the gospel, and there were people for thousands of years that never heard the gospel, but if they would live their life as if they were serving the one true God, God says that'll be credited to their account because they never heard the gospel message, but yet they believed there was a God who would take care of them and everything else. Once a person is presented with the gospel message, there is a record that they had to make a decision. Now, what are you going to do if you have said no to Jesus' offer of salvation, the forgiveness of all sins, the gift of everlasting life? What are you going to do if you said no to that offer? Well, statistics say the average Christian did not make that ultimate life-changing and forever needful decision until, now this is the average, the 46th or 47th time they were presented with the gospel. That does not mean God's going to give you 47 opportunities to get saved. No, that's the average. The average means there's some that took less, some that did more. 47 is kind of like in the middle. When I give you the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior today, I don't know if this is the first time you've ever heard this opportunity or the 112th time you've ever heard the opportunity. You see, that is not up to me. God the Father, from before the foundations of the world, knew you were going to listen to this broadcast today. And he arranged everything in your life and everything in my life to put this recording and this broadcast in front of you today. What you do with it could determine your eternal destiny. Nobody is guaranteed their next breath. Not even me. I could get up after this broadcast, walk down the hallway and have a heart attack and be ushered into the presence of Jesus. I could be going down the stairs to change clothes and fall down the stairs and break my neck. I am not guaranteed five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, I'm not guaranteed one more breath. I could literally have a massive heart attack and die on camera in front of you. Only God knows the exact second each person will take their last breath. So whether this is the first time you've heard this message or the 112th time or the 200th time, that does not matter. The fact is God preordained you to be listening to me right now from before the world began. Amen. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Like I said, some people make the decision the very first time they hear the gospel message. There are those that received him on the 100th opportunity. There are some that have been a thousand times, but they continue to reject his offer of salvation. Each time you say no to Jesus, it gets easier and easier to say no next time. Why? Because the scripture points out, your heart is becoming hardened. I know of specific examples where someone was dying of cancer. They knew they were dying. And when given another opportunity, to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and just receive the promise of what was to come in eternal life, they said no. Why? Because their heart was hard. They had become so accustomed to saying no. It was the automatic response to the question. Think of calluses on your hands. What, do, what is the calluses on your hands? It means you've been working with your hands over time and that skin has gotten so tough that it withstands any you know pressures and things like that. You actually have almost no feeling in your calluses. So you don't know if you're picking up something hot because you have calluses that have built up. You don't know it, and you could get severely burned. By the time you realize it, it's too late. So it is with the plan of salvation. Okay, I cannot say that any person who rejects this offer today will be going to hell. That's not my job. That's not my job to make that determination. I can say and prove through Scripture that the continued rejection of Jesus' plan of salvation is the only deciding factor in someone's ultimate destination. 
Unfortunately, there are some listening to me today who will continue to reject his plan of salvation. There are some whom I care about very deeply that unless they stop playing the world's games, they will not be with me in heaven. And that breaks my heart. But I cannot force them or force you to make that ultimate destination, life-changing decision. All I can do is continue to offer the opportunity, offer to my family, friends, you as well, another opportunity to do so. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Pray it as if your life depended on what you do right now, because it does. Just say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I see the plan of salvation being offered to me. I understand that Jesus came from heaven in bodily form, became a man, lived a sinless life on this earth, and then he offered himself to die in my place. If there is ever one person that deserved to go to heaven, it was him. He didn't have to die for me. He chose to do so. And I thank you, Jesus, for making that choice. You died in my place. I believe that. And I believe God the Father honored that sacrifice you made. And therefore, he raised you from the dead because you did not deserve to die. He raised you from the dead, and then you went to be with him in heaven. You are a true human man seated in the throne room of God at God's right hand. And I believe, Jesus, you are offering this plan of salvation to me right now. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, every single one of them, even sins I don't even know about. And remember, Lord, my very sin nature, I pray you will change. Forgive me, Jesus, of my sins. Come into my heart and into my life. Create in me, Lord Jesus, this new man, one that loves God, one that can be called a child of the Most High God, that I may live with you forever in heaven. And when you come back to this earth, I can reign with you in glorified bodies. Lord Jesus, thank you for offering me this plan of salvation. I accept it. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org, brotherbob at ftfm.org. I want to rejoice with you. Praise the Lord. It means a lot when you tell me I prayed that prayer with you, Brother Bob. That just blesses me. It lets me know that these messages are reaching out with the gospel message. Praise the Lord. And if you do not have a Bible and you live in the continental United States, Email me and let me know, Brother Bob, I don't have a Bible. I will send you your own Bible absolutely free of charge. I'll even pay the postage on it, but it has to be within the continental United States. Praise God. I'm so blessed that you joined us today. If you have any questions, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. If not, till next time, this is Pastor Bob reminding you, be blessed in all that you do. Be blessed. Bye-bye.